Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, Pastor Travis will be back next Sunday. That's the good news. I'd appreciate it if you not applaud too loud. Uh, He asked me to announce he will be beginning a new series. I saw the sign up as I came in from uh, Tom Miller Road. It's called Road Trip. It is an entire Sunday morning series he's doing on the journeys of Abraham. I know you won't want to miss that. And again, as um, Tyler mentioned, um, I am doing this series on Wednesday nights. Travis uh, preaches twice a week, every week, all year, except he takes in the summer a few Wednesday nights off. And so this summer, I'm doing a six-week series on the Holy Spirit, which fits in with this since this is Pentecost Sunday. I'm also going to preach on the Holy Spirit this morning, so I hope you'll come for the next five Wednesdays. Uh, If you can't make them all or you missed the first one, I try to make each one stand alone so that you don't have to hear all of them. You won't feel like you've walked into the middle of a movie, but uh, but I, I hope you will do that. I want to read from Joel chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, Joel chapter 2, I just want to read a few passages here beginning with verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens. In those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion, please make a note, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And for the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now turn to Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, pause just a moment. It means when that exciting moment, the word of it, noised abroad is an odd old-timey phrase, but it means the word of that spread through the streets of Jerusalem. And the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God." And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. New wine meaning cheap wine, popsicle wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. As Jews reckon time, the third hour of the day would be nine o'clock in the morning. So good old practical Simon Peter. There's no high-blown theology here. He says, look, it's 9 a.m. Can't get 120 people so drunk they can't talk plain by nine o'clock in the morning. There's not that much Thunderbird in all of Jerusalem. (laughs) Verse 15, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that, now underline it, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, which we just read. So now he's going to quote it or 
paraphrase it, but it's pretty much a quote. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Put your hands on your Bible and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, we pray that your spirit will brush aside every barrier to divine communication. We believe you for it. Rush in over the threshold of our souls and speak to us by your might in the inner person of every person here. In Jesus' name, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. I wonder if there's anybody, I'm probably the oldest person in the room, I think I am as I look around, but I wonder if there's anybody here that can remember when they used flashcards in elementary school. Anybody remember flashcards? A lot of you. You know why we quit using those, don't you? Yeah, they worked. Um, (laughs) See, uh, we wouldn't want educational reality to stand in the way of theory. So the reason they worked is this. So the teacher would hold up uh, the flashcard on one side, three plus two, and everybody would call the answer out five. And then she'd turn the card over and had five on the back. And she'd do it over and over again. Four plus one, three plus two, over and over again. The concept was, and it worked, that once I got used to seeing it on the card, when I saw it on the test, if it was five on the card, it's going to be five on the test. (laughs) Now everybody may have their own particular biblical hermeneutic, and here's mine, so you can take it for whatever it's worth. But I believe that basically one can understand the entire Old Testament as a set of flashcards, that God is showing pictures, images, visions of things in the Old Testament so that when they happen in the New Testament, people will say, oh, we saw that. If it was that there, then it's that here. We see it in all kinds of ways. That when John Baptist spoke of Jesus as he was baptizing in the Jordan River, when Jesus came down to the riverbank, John Baptist pointed his finger at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's that's. Biblical language, that's every lamb that's ever been slain. Everybody there recognized Passover language. They all understood. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so it's it's saying all the rivers of blood, all the lambs, all the bullocks, all the ashes of all the heifers that have ever been sacrificed in the tabernacle or in the temple, they are all fully consummate in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But all of them spoke to that, spoke to him, spoke to that moment. Now, when it comes to Pentecost, the Jewish feast of Shavuot, um, it is called Pentecost in English because it was called Pentecost in Greek. In Hebrew, it was Shavuot. But it's calculated as 50 days from the second day of Passover. So there's the first day of Passover, then the second day is day one. And then there's seven weeks. You count the Omer, seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49, plus the day you start counting equals 50. So you know, as well as I do, that in Greek, any any word that has a derivative of five in it is penta, pentagram, the pentagon, uh, pentathlete, the athlete that performs in five different parts of track and field. So Pentecost, when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Septuagint, they wanted a Greek word for Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. So it's seven weeks. 
Seven times seven is 49. The second day of Pentecost equals 50. And the Greeks said, ah, Pentecost. So it is Pentecost. It is an ancient Jewish feast. Pentecost is not exclusively or peculiarly a Christian word. It is a word which we have appropriated from a Jewish feast that goes all the way back to Moses that we have used the word because what we celebrate today, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, happened on the Jewish feast of Pentecost. But the Jewish feast of Pentecost was really a harvest feast. It was about the beginning of the barley harvest. It's one of the reasons that uh, on the day of Pentecost in Jewish synagogues, usually what is read is the book of Ruth. Oddly enough, but the book of Ruth is about the harvest. It's about, it's about the, the um, barley harvest that was going on in Bethlehem. Secondly, it's, they read the book of Ruth because Jewish tradition, it's not in scripture, but Jewish tradition is that King David was born on Pentecost and died on Pentecost. And that he is traditionally buried on Mount Zion. So when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes on Mount Zion in the upper room, later on, we didn't read the whole sermon, but Peter says, David's body, David was buried and his body is here with us now. So this is happening in the upper room on Mount Zion on the birthday and celebration of the death day of King David. So it's a Jewish feast that remembers David, it remembers harvest, it remembers the book of Ruth. It's not really about an expected outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? It means that I don't think anybody in the upper room, the 120 gathered there, woke up that morning and said, Acts chapter 2, <laughs> 20 minutes to 9, 20 minutes to 9, and we're ready to rock and roll. I don't believe they expected an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It had nothing in their minds. There was no association with it. It was a Jewish feast of harvest, a festival of harvest celebration that went back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So they were Jews who were doing what they had done, what their parents had done, their ancestors had done back to the time of Moses. They got up that morning and went to celebrate the feast of Shavuot, Pentecost. When the power of the Holy Spirit happened that day, I don't think anybody said, I knew this. <laughs> I think it caught them completely off guard. Think what happens now. There is the sound of a mighty rushing wind that sweeps through the room. Not a wind, the sound of a wind sweeps through the room. Imagine you're sitting right here and a tornado, the sound of a tornado just goes through the room. Not a hair on your head ruffled by a breeze, but the sound of a wind over your head. Wouldn't that be exciting? Might scare the liver out of you, but wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> and no sooner does that go than right up here in the middle of the room, the boiling, tumultuous Shekinah glory, a, a a fire of God, which whirls off into a flame, a visible, physical, dancing flame of fire that comes to rest over every head in the room. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, I'm just a visiting Presbyterian. <laughs> Doesn't matter, you get one. Everybody in the room. And then no sooner does the fire disappear than you find yourself standing up and preaching the word of God in the tongues of men and of angels. There are 13 physical languages listed here. Mede, Elamite, Parthian. I wonder what in the world Elamite is. I bet there are not 10 people extant in the world today that speak Elamite. But you do. You suddenly stand and begin to proclaim. You know what would happen? What would happen is exactly what happened there. Soon we wouldn't be able to get the cars in the parking lot. 
There would this, as fast as this church is growing, imagine if it went from what it has in the past six, six, six or eight years while Pastor Travis has been here to what it is now. Imagine if it went from this today to 5,000 in the morning. And people couldn't get in. They'd be out in the parking lot. And they would say, what happened in there? What is all that about? Some donkey in the parking lot says, oh, they're just stoned. <laughs> they are stoned out of their skulls. And Simon Peter says, that's not possible. In the first place, it's 9 a.m. Think what you're saying. But then he makes this remarkable statement. And this is what we want to key in on. He says this, what we're experiencing, what we're seeing, this is that which was prophesied by Joel. We have absolutely no indication in Scripture that that moment was set up by Jesus. We have no indication that Jesus said to anybody on the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit's going to come, and when it does, I want you to quote Joel chapter 2. It seems to be, apparently, an absolutely spontaneous moment in Simon Peter's life. Simon Peter says, I recognize this flashcard. This is that which was prophesied by Joel, and he quotes it. Peter is not a rabbi. He is a professional fisherman. He's a tough guy, hard worker. He's got calluses on his hands and calluses on his brain. This is not a, this is not a genius. In fact, when he is called in before the Sanhedrin later in the story, it says, and they saw that he was ignorant and unlearned. So spontaneously, in the light of the context in which he finds himself, he reaches back over thousands of years of Jewish history, tradition, and scripture, and he plucks a tiny little passage of scripture from a minor prophet named Joel, and he quotes it at random. He says this, I know what this is. This is that. This is that which was prophesied by Joel hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And he quotes it. I'll show blood and fire, vapor of smoke, signs and wonders. And those that are in Mount Zion, where it's happening, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that we somehow have the idea, and Pastor Tyler spoke to it a moment ago briefly, that we celebrate Pentecost as a memorial to a once and never again historical reality. When I, when I was in seminary, um, and I went to a decidedly liberal seminary, I'm not, I'm not defaming them. If they were here, they would tell you they were liberal proudly. But the understanding of Pentecost that I was given was exactly that, that it was like a museum piece, that you walk through all the things that happened in the, on the day of Pentecost, and like viewing some artifact. We say, ooh, that was cool. Oh, wow, look at that. We'd read the labels under the artifacts. That was great, that was great. But I was actually taught, the church has come of age. That's a quote. We no longer need the early rockets of the, of the day of Pentecost. That was to get the church started. That was to, to do the blast off. But those rockets have fallen away. We no longer need them. They're the excess baggage of a never again to repeat, be repeated time of church history. And now the church has come of age. It is absolute blasphemy. Amen. We are, we, if we are operating, living, leading, and doing ministry under our own power, we are doomed. The power of the Holy Spirit that descended upon the church on the day of Pentecost was not a once and never again to be repeated reality. It was the open door of a current reality. Right now, this is Pentecost. So we're not celebrating something that happened once. 
We are invoking, receiving, and walking in something that is happening right now. That is, is happening right now. This is that. This is that. Simon Peter identified it. He saw it. He remembered the flashcard. This is that. John Wesley finished at Oxford University. He was an Oxford Don. He was there with his brother Charles. And another memorable student was with them, George Whitfield. They formed, along with another boy, a fourth boy, a prayer group uh, while they were at Oxford, which they modestly named the Holy Club. And <laughs> when they graduated, John and Charles wanted to be missionaries to the Indians. They, they, they wanted to sacrifice of the Lord. They were determined. They were faithful. They were obedient. But they were in the flesh. And they said, where is the worst place, the worst place in the whole world that somebody could surf? We want to go there. They said, Georgia. And <laughs> so John and Charles came to Georgia to be missionaries to the Indians. Neither of them ever saw an Indian. Charles became the private secretary because of his Oxford education. Charles became the private secretary of General Oglethorpe, who was the founder of the colony of Georgia. John was appointed to be the parish priest of an upscale, very prosperous Episcopal Anglican church in Savannah, for which he was ideally ill-suited. Uh, it was a disaster. He fell in love with the daughter of a very wealthy man, proposed marriage to her. She rejected him, and in his flesh, he got all angry and hurt with her, and rejected. I guess nobody grooves on rejection, but he got mad. When Sunday came and she came forward for communion, he refused to serve her. He bypassed her. But in the Anglican church, the only reason that the priest can refuse to serve communion to a woman is if she is promiscuous. So by passing her, he announced, this woman is a harlot. Her father sued him. The bailiffs came to arrest him. He fled in the night to his brother Charles at General Oglethorpe's headquarters. They got him on a ship to send him back to England. And he wrote in his diary, I went to America to save the Indians, but who will save me? While he was on the ship, there's a terrible storm. And there... Looks like the ship is going to sink. Wesley goes down into the hold of the ship and there's a group of Germans, Moravians down there. And they're worshiping and singing. And John Wesley says, don't you understand we're about to sink? They said, yes. <laughs> they said, we'll be in heaven in the next few minutes. He's so shocked by them. They said, if we should get back to London, John also speaks, he's very well educated. He's also fluent in German. So they said, when we get back to London, we have a prayer meeting in Aldersgate Street. Why don't you come and join with us? So he goes. And when John Wesley hears Luther's preface to the book of Romans being read in German, don't you know that was spine-tingling stuff? <laughs> An academic German treatise on the book of Romans, but it is being read in John Wesley said he heard, the righteous shall live by faith. And he said, my heart was strangely warmed. And the power of the Holy Spirit fell in one of the greatest revivals in the history of the world that set England ablaze, leapt the whole, all the oceans, was a worldwide revival. A worldwide revival. But John Wesley didn't invent the Holy Ghost. He said, this is that. Yes. 